kids here at New Day. I get to have a few, um, remind you of a few announcements uh, before we uh, continue our service. Uh, so, so the kids can be dismissed to, to kids' church uh, at this time. In a few moments, we will uh, be able to, to give of our tithes and our offerings. There's, there's, there's information in the seat pockets in front of you, different ways you can give. So just want to give you a moment to get that prepared if you need to. Uh, on the, on the, in the chair in front of you, there's also a connection card. We use this just across the board as a way for you to communicate with us um, so, that, so that we can get your information, so that whatever prayers you have, whatever life stuff you have going on, if you have a practical need that you need help with, you can even just write that on there and place it in the offering basket as it passes by. And if you're new with us, we would actually ask you to take that connection card, not put it in the bucket, but on the way after service, go over to the welcome table. We have a gift for you. We want to be able to tell you a little bit more about who we are as a church, answer any questions you might have. And so please do that. All right, so just a few quick announcements uh, for us this morning. Next week, uh, if you show up here, you're going to be disappointed because no one will be here. Uh, we have church at the camp next week, Bear Lake Bible Camp, about 45 minutes south of here. Uh, what we do this, we've done this a couple years now, we can call it our annual church at the camp, um, where all three New Day congregations just get together, it's going to be in the afternoon, 2 to 6.30 p.m., and, and we're just going to come together, have fun, there's going to be a ton of things that are available to do at the camp, swimming, and, and zip lining, and putt-putt golf, and a bunch of, a bunch of things, uh, so just come ready to have fun. Please bring a, a dish, a dessert, and a cooler because we'll have dinner together and then we'll be, we'll be able to worship together in closing. And so that can be fun. All right. I just got word <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> that um, a friend of mine, somebody who's, who's been through the Wellspring School, is able to give a testimony uh, this morning about what, what it is and, uh, and why you might want to, to, to do it. So Dave, could you come up? Let's give Dave Ives a hand. You can just say anything. So step up up, up here. <laughs> should, I hold, should I hold the mic? Anything. No. They know how to get me on stage. They, they try. Um, biggest thing about Wellspring, I think, um, one of the big things I learned was getting out of the comfort zone, which this is out of the comfort zone, which they learned. Um, kind of like, I think, Jill, yeah. Um, but the biggest thing was um, God making the uncomfortable comfortable. Um, even prophesying over others, it was it was great to find out we were on the same page. Like me and Diane over there, she was my big partner on that one, um, and uh, just the the excitement of seeing people you don't know, but you're impacting. So it's great. Amen. Yeah. Thank you, Dave. Hey, Good job. Drag me up here. All right. Yes. <laughs> just, just in right. That was very. Um, in the moment. I appreciate that. So yeah, so Wellspring, just real quick, you can find out more on our website, but it starts in less, no, yes, less than a month. This starts September 8th, Sunday, and it goes through about eight months. Every, every Sunday afternoon we meet together, and so if you're interested in finding out more, Chloe and I will be available after service to talk to you about it, but it, I highly encourage anybody who wants to grow in their ability to minister just in the love of God to consider doing this school. All right, that's all I have. I'll invite the ushers to come forward at this time, and I'll just be able to just pray for that as well as for the rest of the service. So join with me. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness. God, every good and perfect gift comes from you. What do we have that we have not received? God, we thank you uh, that your goodness pervades our life, that your mercies are new every morning, that your faithfulness is never-ending. And God, we pray for, for the offering, God, that those who 
who give will be blessed in their giving, God, for, for the money that's given, God, that it would be used to further your purposes in the earth and in, this, in the Kalamazoo region. Uh, so we pray blessing over that. I also pray for Pastor Anthony as he comes up and brings the word this morning, beginning a new series for us, that we would have ears to hear uh, and just a, a, an eagerness, God, to, to apply and to act on what Pastor Anthony brings this morning. So God, we, we bless him, we thank you for him, and we pray just for your anointing to be upon him as he brings your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's give Anthony a hand as he comes forward. Oh, you, you got to... No, 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 you're right. Thank you, Jimmy. God bless you. you that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm just going <laughs> to use the book as a prop. That's the first thing every week. How are you guys doing today? Excellent. So first service, like this is the faithful remnant of Israel, right? This is, these are the true believers. So thank you for coming. I like talking here. I am the pastor of the Vine Campus over in the Vine neighborhood. So I'm on Locust Street and I preach over there on Saturday nights. And as I say every time, sometimes they forget to lock the doors and I sneak out and I show up here on Sunday morning. And this is one of those days. Guys, it is my pleasure to start a sermon series called Could We Be Wrong? Why did we call a series that? What church is this honest? It's crazy. Well, here's the deal, right? I've been a Christian since I was almost too young to remember. I was raised in basically a, a Baptist tradition, as I've mentioned several times. And when you're raised in a baptist -y church, you're getting saved like three times a week, right? Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday. So I've been a Christian for a long time, but it doesn't matter how many years you're a Christian. At some point, you're at the Christian bookstore and you see the ocean of Bibles, and you say to yourself, God's word? Really? It's 2019. It's in English. Like, eh, could we be wrong about this? Or are you thinking one day, you're praying and you're like, I'm praying to a Jewish guy that claimed to be God 2,000 years ago? Really? Am I doing that right now? Could we be wrong about this? You know what I mean? And when you have those feelings, fret not. You are not some sort of unsaved pagan sinner who's been fooling yourself your whole life. You are a human, right? So we face these moments where we wonder, could we be wrong? And then we get bolstered up in our faith and we recommit. Today, I want to encourage believers about the reliability of the Bible, okay? If you've ever wondered, could we be wrong about this Bible thing, this whole inspired scripture, word of God thing? I want you to leave today excited about the Word. If you're a Christian, I want you to just dig into it like you've never dug into it before. And hopefully, if you're on the fence, you're not a Christian, maybe you're not a believer, you do not think the Bible is God's Word. Man, today I want to draw you to the Bible only secondarily. What I hope to do primarily is to draw you to the presence of the person of Jesus Christ. That is my goal. And I want to say this, if that is you, if you're on the fence about believing, or if you're a believer who really is a nerd like I am and you want some good information, this book, man, I Do Not Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist by Norman Geisler and Frank Turek. I was forced to read it against my will years ago, and I have been grateful ever since. Man, hop on Amazon, order it. It is entertainingly written. It is full of great info. It is absolutely fantastic. Plus, it'll make you laugh. All right, should we dig in? Excellent. The Bible. First question I want to ask is, do we even need the Bible? Can I just have a relationship with God on my own? Do I need some book that claims to be authoritative to show me how to do it? Certainly, I can have an individual one-on-one -on -one thing with God as I see fit, right? Well, to talk about the problem with that, I want to talk about the story of the elephant. Has anybody heard this, right? This is old hat, man. It's a uh, I think it's from India, I'm not sure. It is for sure from some place that had elephants. I know that. But the story goes like this. Some blind men stumble upon an elephant, but they don't know what it is. So they try to describe it to each other without knowing what it is they're touching. And so one of them grabs a, grabs a tusk and says, hey, whatever this thing is, it's like a spear. And one of them grabs the legs and says, no, 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 you're crazy. Whatever it is, it's more like a tree. And then one of them is on the side of the elephant. And he's like, I'm not even sure you guys are touching what I'm touching. This thing's like a wall. And the guy who grabs the ear says, no, 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 this is more like a fan. And the guy who grabs the tail says, whatever this is that we're dealing with is like a rope. And so the point of this story is to say that when it comes to religions, you know, maybe, 
even though all these different religions are so vastly different, maybe we're just grabbing different pieces of the same thing. Huh? So even though they're all wildly different, maybe none of them are wrong. So it's kind of this, there's no absolute truth, relativistic type stuff that we talked about a few weeks ago. God has ruined this for us. Because what we have now is a situation as if the elephant says, actually, I'm an elephant. And then explains, these are my teeth, that's my tail, legs, side, ears, and so on. If the elephant discloses itself and explains itself, that clears up all the confusion, right? And actually, if you want to maintain a belief different about the elephant than what the elephant tells you, you're kind of being rebellious. If we had any hope of understanding a God who is beyond our understanding, that hope was that God would reveal himself in a way we could understand. Does that make sense? That is what the Bible is. It's a record of God disclosing himself to people in a way that people could understand. So we need it. If we don't have it, we're just guessing. So the next logical question is, if we need God to reveal himself to us, if we're going to understand him at all, would he? Is he the type of God that would do that? You look around the world and different religions, there's all different kinds of little g, quote unquote, gods, and some of them are not very nice, you know? So do we have a God that would bother to reveal himself to us poor, ignorant humans? And the short answer to that is absolutely yes. Let's check this out, okay? The Bible starts, God creates two people. They promptly stab him in the back. God shows up. Their son is a murderer. God responds by showing up. The whole world becomes corrupt, so God shows up. After God floods the world, he shows up again, just to encourage and make sure everybody's okay. And then, God shows up to start his own nation. He calls a guy named Abram and says, you're Abraham now, me and you are going to do this great thing. Then God keeps showing up to encourage this guy and his children. And finally, God shows up to call a dude named Moses. We have just gotten to the second book of the Bible. <laughs> It's like, God cannot keep himself from showing up. God can barely contain himself from revealing who he is, what he's about. It seems like God is driven to intervene. It seems like God just can't stand it. When he sees one of the people that he's chosen and they're going through a hard time, man, he's right there, dude. He shows up all the time. This is just in the book of Genesis. This trend continues for 65 more, right? And by the time we get to Moses in the second book of the Bible, there's a little bit of a tweak in, in God's plan and maybe in the intelligence of the people that are listening to him because Moses decides, hey, God is revealing himself. Maybe, just maybe, we should write this down. Exodus 24, 3 to 4. Moses just got this awesome download from God. He's talking to the people. And it says that Moses came and recounted to the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances that he just heard from God. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. And then Moses did something absolutely brilliant in verse 4 and wrote down the words of the Lord. So God not only reveals himself to us, he seems driven to do it. And you might ask why. And we're going to close with the answer to that question, by the way. But not only does he reveal himself, but he wants it written down. In fact, later in the book of Exodus, God tells Moses, Hey, you're going to meet me on the top of this mountain. I'm going to give you my law. I'm going to tell you what I'm like, and I'm going to tell you how I want you to live. Because you won't figure it out on your own. You need me to reveal that to you. And what I'm going to do, because I'm God and I love you, is I'm going to grab some stone tablets, and I'm going to write it down for you. Because there's going to be a lot of words. Maybe he's worried Moses' wrist would get tired or something. So God writes down the law and gives it to Moses. Moses come down, comes down the mountain and what happens next? Anybody? He breaks them, right? He sees that the people are sinning. You know, he's only been gone like a couple of weeks, I guess. He sees that the people are off the rails. He breaks the tablets. Everybody say, oh. Now what a cop out would this be, right? Like... Well, guys, I mean, God, you know, God came down and he wrote the law on himself miraculously, but gosh darn it, Moses broke the tablets, you know. Just, that's, that explains why we don't have God's word. Not so, man. Exodus chapter 34, God says, you know what? We're doing this again. You will have a written copy 
of my law. He says, this time you're carving the dang tablets, but I'm going to write it out a second time. In Exodus 34, 1 and 2, God wants to reveal himself. It seems like he's driven to do it. He wants us to have a written copy of what he says. And by the time we get to Moses' successor, Joshua, in Joshua chapter 1, he can just encourage Joshua to remember what's already been written down. Check this out. Joshua 1, 7 and 8. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. And then he says, things will go well with you. Long story short, guys, if we wanted to know anything at all about a God who's beyond our understanding, we needed that God to reveal himself to us in a way that we can understand. It seems like he's compelled to do it over and over. He can barely contain himself. And he intends that revelation to be written down and remembered. Everybody said amen. I could just stop there, but I won't. I have so many more cool facts. Guys, that is good. But I have to ask at this point, doesn't that seem like an awful lot of trouble for God? Already, we're in book three of the Bible, right? Book six, actually, chronologically. Never mind. But God is going through a lot of trouble to disclose himself. He's going through a lot of trouble to make sure we have a written copy. And he's going through an awful lot of trouble to make sure that we thick-headed human beings remember it. So you might ask, why would he go through that much trouble? I will perhaps close with the answer to that question. But first, let's talk about the Old Testament. Can you trust what we have written down in 2019 that we're supposed to believe was given to Moses like 3,000 years ago? Let me address what I think is the number one best common sense argument against believing in Scripture. Okay? If you just think about it, you say, gosh, an awful lot of time has passed, things change over time, and I've played the game of telephone, so I know how this works. So there's literally no way that what we have written down now is the same as what God said way back then. Does that make sense, that, that logic? Who's played the game of telephone? Have we all done that? Okay, sweet. So, right, you make a circle, and they tell you that the rules of the game are that you're supposed to whisper, right? You whisper to the person next to you, a phrase or a word, and then you don't want to be too loud because the game is that that person has to remember it and whisper it to the next person. And if more than that one person hears you, then, you know, it kind of blows the game. And then they tell you that the purpose of the game is to see if it can, if it can be remembered all the way around, right? How many of you know that is not the purpose of the game of telephone? The purpose of the game is to see what a jumbled mess you can have at the end so everybody can laugh, right? This is exactly the opposite of what happened in the Old Testament. They were recording God's words. They took that seriously. In order to create a metaphor, we'd have to forget all about the game of telephone, and we'd have to have more like a classroom setting, almost like this. And I would instead say what I have to say loudly so that everyone can hear, and now we would recite what I just said one by one. So Jimmy would recite it, and then the whole community could correct him if he was wrong. If I want to store information now, I probably will write it on a Google Doc, and I will save it on my computer. We're so advanced now, we have this thing called the cloud, which I don't think anyone understands. And, you know, even if my computer is broken, the information is safe in the cloud, whatever that is, right? That's where we store important information. Back when the Old Testament was given, the storage place for those files, if you will, was the community. It was us. So we communicated information not to play a game, not to see if we could remember, but to get it transmitted accurately. So the checks and balance was all of us. It was an oral culture. This is how they passed on information and they took it very seriously. It's not the game of telephone. We have to forever throw away that analogy. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't work. Okay? All right. Moving on. We do have to admit, though, that the Old Testament is kind of mysterious. It was God's word. They took it seriously. 
but I can't tell you that on Thursday of such and such a day, a golden scroll came down from heaven and we had the whole Old Testament. Do you know why I can't say that? Because God was revealing his truth to individuals over the course of hundreds of years. That's just the truth, man. You know, he's a relational God who still deals with individuals on an individual basis. And that took a long, long time. Man, some of the Old Testament books say who wrote them, some don't. But the fact is that we had a lot of copies of the Old Testament books. We had it in Hebrew. By the time of Jesus, they were already being copied in Greek. I mean, they were all over the place. And was there some bickering about which books were authoritative and which weren't? Yes, there was. Most of that was about the books called the Apocrypha. Have you guys heard of these? So, I mean, they're not bad books. Mostly they're like little stories and, and books of history that were written during the exile between what we call the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, I went to seminary. My professors, actually specifically Dr. Turner, liked reading the Apocrypha. But he didn't read it as the authoritative word of the Lord. He read it because you could get into the mindset of the people in that period, because you could understand you know, the context of their thought. But they are distinct from Holy Scriptures. They never got the buy-in. They aren't official. They're not bad. But they're not scripture. Does that make sense? And certainly by the first century, the Old Testament was set in stone. The first century, historian Josephus said, look, we've got our sacred texts. They're set, and that's all there is to it. So do we know exactly when and how that happened? No. I'm sorry. I'm not going to lie. But the fact is, it did. And God's sacred scriptures were preserved. Now on an up note... Has anybody heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? You know, there's crazy stuff in the Old Testament. So if you read it, like in the book of Daniel, the prophecies in Daniel are so accurate that some scholars, a lot of scholars will say, well, they must be fake. They must be accurate because they're written after the events actually happened. Aha! It's fake prophecy, you see. You know, we have some stuff in the Old Testament about Jesus. Specifically in Isaiah, if you read... Uh, Isaiah chapter 53, 54, and 55, that's wild, man. I mean, you know, in Isaiah it says, the virgin will give birth and you will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. You know, you read that and it's like, how do I not think Jesus? It's obvious. You know, you read about how there's going to be a suffering servant that comes that suffers for our transgressions. By his stripes we are healed. It says he's pierced for our transgressions. It's just absolutely a dead ringer for the crucifixion you know, in the, in the flogging of Jesus. It's like, man, how can you not see Jesus in this text? Well, I mean, you could say you see Jesus in those texts because they were written after Jesus. Just more fake prophecies, don't you know? And you could argue that until 1947. Because it turns out that while old documents and parchments have a tendency to decay and rot fairly quickly, if you stick them in a cave, like say, one of these caves, around the Dead Sea, where it's super dry, turns out those suckers have a shelf life of over 1,947 years. <laughs> so one day, a shepherd boy is chasing his goats in the scare out of this cave. He throws a rock. Here's a jar break. He discovers the first of, I believe, 12 caves that have hundreds of jars of hundreds of scrolls they had been kept there by a Jewish community. They're from 200 BC. Is that before the time of Jesus? Yes. They have copies of every single Old Testament book except Esther, including a scroll called the Great Isaiah Scroll. What do you think the Great Isaiah Scroll contained? A whole copy of the book of Isaiah. The Emmanuel, God with us, virgin birth, pierced for our transgressions one. From before Jesus, not after. This was an enor enormous find. An incredible faith booster as well, I might add. So, can you trust the Old Testament? Yeah, man, you can trust the Old Testament, for sure. Now, let's move on and let's talk about the New Testament. I hope this isn't dry, because I really enjoy this kind of stuff. So, And if I'm dry, the authors of I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist are way more entertaining than I am, and you should get that book. All right. The New Testament is a whole other thing, man. While the Old Testament is kind of mysterious, the New Testament really is not. We can trace how that was formed pretty easily. And uh, 
let's do that right now. First of all, why 27 books? Why do we have 27 official books that we call the New Testament canon? Well, actually, in a weird way, we have a heretic to thank for that. Somebody say, boo, heretic, boo. In 150 AD, a heretic named Martian, Martian, <laughs> sorry, <clears throat> sorry, Martian, he compiles a list of books and he's like, these are the sacred scriptures. Now, the early church was operating under the assumption that they had the sacred scriptures. It was assumed that certain books just were sacred scriptures. Like there was never any doubt about the writings of Paul or the Gospels. And they were just operating under the assumption that everybody knew this until this guy comes along and offers an official list of books. And the church looks at this official look of book, list of books and says, man, this is wacky. Some of these books we've never seen before. These are abbreviated portions of, of this and that. And so the church responds quickly. And they decide that it's probably about time to decide what's official and what's not. So they respond by saying, hey, this crap is crap. And they call it out and they explain why. And they also respond by compiling an official list of their own. In 180 AD, we have a canon called the Muratorian Canon. That's the very first official list of books that the, the church ever had. And right there, bam, he slaps down 22 of the eventual 27 books of the New Testament. Right there in 180 AD, super early. Now, I want to point out that the church is not like this gigantic, you know, money-soaked powerhouse with political influence, right? We're talking about a persecuted group of people, okay? So, just dispel the idea that this is some sort of weird conspiracy or something like that. It's not. But the Muratorian Canon contains all the books of the New Testament except Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, and 3rd John, which were accepted later. Why weren't they accepted right from the beginning? Because we're talking about sacred scripture. We're talking about compiling a list of books that we know for sure are the words of God given to us by the people that he chose. And so, it's not to say these books weren't respected. It's not to say that those books weren't thought to be scripture by a lot of people, but they didn't make the cut as officially official initially, but they did eventually. When is eventually? Well, I'll tell you. The biblical canon was officially closed at the Council of Carthage in 397. So, why would you go through the trouble of officially closing something that everybody pretty much agreed on anyway? And the answer is threefold. One, new books kept popping up. And unlike scholars today who seem to be suckers for just about anything, you know, in the old days, when a new gospel showed up, the early church was pretty quick to say, thank you, we've had the gospels for a long time, and Peter didn't have a younger brother named Sam. Like, this is trash, you know? But more and more kept popping up. You know, the Gnostic movement started. We had all these books claiming to be the gospel of this or the book of that or the lost writings of so-and-so. And the church was like, enough is enough. We need to have an official list to combat this garbage that's working its way in. Second, they had a newfangled invention called a codex. And in a codex, you could bind a bunch of different texts together, but not an indefinite amount. You could only fit so many writings in a codex. So they had to narrow it down to what is absolutely official. And third, Emperor Diocletian hated Christians. He hated them so much that from 303 to, I think, 311 AD, he issued an order that said the Christian texts should be destroyed and anyone in possession of them should be executed. And the early church wanted to make sure that they were dying for the correct books because they were way more hardcore than we are, I am afraid. So, they decided what those official books were, and they ran with it. And even though Diocletian destroyed hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of manuscripts, he didn't get them all. We'll talk about that in a minute. And actually, I just read this morning, even if he had destroyed every single copy of every New Testament book, the early church fathers were so prolific in their quotations of Scripture, we have every chapter and verse of the New Testament, except I think 11 verses, <laughs> quoted in the writings of the early church fathers. These people, their letters must have been like, hey, I'm Tim, chapters of scripture, have a good day. You know what I mean? That's what they wanted to convey. Why? 
Because it's the words of God, man. And they took it seriously. All right. Anthony, how did they choose? Because we've read the Da Vinci Code and all this crazy stuff, and we know that there's this church conspiracy, right? And they handpick certain books of the Bible, probably to manipulate the masses, right? Not so. At the Council of Carthage, they generally had these guidelines. If a book was going to be considered scripture, it had to have been written by an apostle or a close associate of an apostle. It had to be true. It couldn't be one of these nonsensical fantasy novel-like fake gospels that were, that were popping up. It had to be factually correct. It had to be in agreement with other things that we have no doubt are sacred scripture. And it had to have been used and recognized as official by the church already. So Bruce, Bruce Metzger, a scholar, I believe from Princeton, says it this way. He says that the canon, the official list of the books, is a list of authoritative books more than it is an authoritative list of books. These documents did not derive their authority from being selected. Each one was authoritative before anyone gathered them together. In other words, this council got together and said, these books are legit, so we pick them. They didn't say, we pick them, therefore they're legit. Because can you imagine being the guy in that meeting? It was arguing like, oh man, those verses on how we're going to be hated by the world. Oh man, I love that so much. We got to get that in there. Like those verses about how like if we don't carry our cross and follow Jesus, we're not worthy of him. Oh, it speaks to my heart. We just, we got to get that in there. All that stuff about how he hates divorce and you know those, that rigid moral code. Oh, make sure that makes the cut. Like, who's going to argue for that? If you want proof that there's no conspiracy about what books were picked and what weren't, read the New Testament. Let it beat you up for a little bit and think who in their right mind would have fought for this, right? Okay, moving on. Who likes cool facts? I like cool facts. Ancient writings are ancient because they're written a long time ago. I know, it's crazy. It's crazy. So what happens is we have an approximate date that they probably wrote the original, right? But then we have surviving copies. And the surviving copies are usually, my goodness, well, here you go, like usually about a thousand years removed from the original. So this funny thing with Homer, like the Iliad and the Odyssey, right? Our, our su surviving copy that's the oldest was probably copied about 500 years after Homer wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey. You know, Plato, where is that? 1,200? And yet, nobody reads Homer or Plato and says, well, you know, the telephone effect. I mean, these probably aren't even reliable. You know, I actually read a little bit of Plato. Like, not, I picked a bad one. Leonard tells me it was the least entertaining. But I never once wondered, like, I wonder how many times this has been changed. You know what I mean? Even though there's a thousand years intervening. Because we trust people to copy things accurately. Guys, there's probably only about 25 years between the original writings of the New Testament and the earliest copies. Do you realize even if you go hog wild nuts and quadruple that to 100, that's still like the next day, historically speaking. That is crazy close. That is right there. And what would you expect, really? These people have the words of the Lord. They believe they are giving sacred scripture. They believe that God is speaking through them to the church, and the church receives that from Peter, from Paul, from James, you know, as the words of God through that person for them. What would you do if you got a letter from someone and you knew for sure that these were the words of God? You would stay up all night making copies of that thing, wouldn't you? Everybody you know would want a copy of that. So we would expect to have handwritten copies of books of the Bible just littered all over the Middle East and Northern Africa and Europe, right? Yes, there are tons of of manuscript portions of the New Testament, well over 5,000 and counting. They're tripping over them. Uh, yeah, and look at the number of copies of Homer and all those other guys. It's super small. Guys, the New Testament is far and away, no contest, the best attested ancient work ever. Nothing is even close. Nothing is close to being close. That's because people thought they had the words of God, right? You would copy the snot out of that stuff. So anyway, this is pretty cool. When I was in Cornerstone doing my undergrad, we had a guy come in as a guest speaker named John Carroll. And his job 
He was super gifted in languages. He knew like over a dozen ancient languages. I mean, we're talking about like Aramaic and Babylonian and ancient Greek and all this stuff. So his job was that he was commissioned, usually by wealthy people like the DeVosses or whoever else, to go and validate ancient documents. So he's like in Turkey and Egypt and all these crazy places at archaeological digs. And he brought some of these documents to class. And he just had them like pressed between glass with like clips on them. And he's handing them out. And he's like, yeah, be careful with these. They haven't been appraised yet. They'll probably sell for, you know, probably a few million each. That's crazy. But that's what this guy does all the time. I felt like I was meeting Indiana Jones in real life. But my point is, there are so many ancient copies because the church understood that these are the words of God for us. It was like gold, man. You know, they took it so seriously. All right, moving on. The New Testament authors validate the Old Testament. I know I'm running short on time here, so I'm going to go quick. But check this out. Doo -doo -doo. Second Peter 1, 20 to 21. But know this, first of all, Peter says, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. This is Peter who walked with God saying the Old Testament scriptures are the words of God because the Holy Spirit was speaking through the people that wrote them down. Let's look at one more. This is Paul writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. Paul says, hey Tim, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. All scripture is inspired by God. He's talking about the Old Testament. Here's yet another one. Acts 1, 15 to 16. The disciples are bummed out because they used to be a jolly band of 13 and then Jesus was crucified and Judas killed himself. That's a rough time. So Peter decides to speak to the crowd and he says this. Peter said, Brethren, this is Acts chapter 1, 16. The scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas. So he says, David wrote the psalm, and then he quotes the psalms, but that wasn't actually David. That was the Holy Spirit speaking through David. And I'll do one more New Testament verse that validates the Old Testament as God's word. This is from another guy you might know named Jesus. Matthew 19, 4-5. This is really kind of interesting how this happens. They're talking to him. And Jesus says this, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, you might read right past that, because he's saying, Haven't you read that God said, you know, that for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife? And you might say, Oh yeah, that's in the Old Testament. It is. But in the Old Testament, it's not introduced as a quotation from God. In Genesis 2.24 that he's quoting, these are just the words of the author. The author tells the story of creation, and the author says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife. Jesus is endorsing the words of the author as the words of God. That's pretty amazing. So, can you trust the Old Testament? Yes, absolutely. The New Testament authors that we can for sure trust even go as far as to validate the Old Testament. And not only that, they validate each other. The New Testament writers knew they were writing scripture. This is obvious to me. Like, if you're like Peter, James, and John, and you're with Jesus, you know, you see the transfiguration, he dies, he comes back to life, he cooks you breakfast on shore, like, there's not a whole lot of doubt in your mind, right? Like, this is the Son of God, you put your hands in the scars and stuff, you know? And then when he comes to you in a vision and speaks to you, like, you're going to write that down. And you're going to be fairly confident, right? Like, these are the words of the Lord. You know what I mean? They knew what was going on. They knew they had a unique role. And they talked about each other this way. There's a part in the New Testament where Peter talks about Paul, which is, for various reasons, I think, absolutely hilarious. But <laughs> Second Peter writes to people, Peter writes to people in Second Peter 3, 15 to 16, and says this. Read the whole chapter, by the way. It's pretty awesome. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, 
Just as our dear brother Paul, who rebuked me terribly in Galatia, we'll skip that. Just as our dear brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do the other scriptures, to their own destruction. This is Peter validating the writings of Paul as sacred scripture. Wisdom given to Paul right from God. That's pretty awesome. And that leads us to Jesus. Now, Jesus is going to get his own week, as he should. We're going to talk about how the evidence for him actually existing outside the Bible is amazing. We're going to talk about how, it's one, it's astounding that anything is written about some peasant in the far corner of the Roman Empire that held no political position and was executed. Like, that doesn't make any sense, but there's a ton of evidence. So, Jesus is actually the center point of the New Testament. He's the center point of the whole Bible. He's probably the single best reason for believing the Bible because he's so well attested. And also, I think Jesus gives us the why. Jesus tells us why God would go through the trouble to continually reveal himself to a bunch of people that seem like they just can't get it. Not only does he say it, not only does he say write it down, not only does he say remember it, but he comes in person and lives and dies to validate his word. Why? The Old Testament says in two different verses that there's a way that seems right to man, but in the end, what? It leads to death. That's in Proverbs 14 and Proverbs 16. In the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, Jesus says this, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. This is true. I think that it's because we are prone to error. It's because if we were left to our own devices, we would pick ways of thinking and acting and living and being that are absolutely wrong. That we would not get it. Because even the ways that seem right to us lead to death. That's why God was so emphatic and so driven to reveal himself to us. Because we couldn't get it without him. He wants us to live. He doesn't want us to die. And he knows that short of revealing himself over and over and over, taking the most dramatic step possible and coming and dying for us, we would not live. That is true. And that is why I think we have the Bible. Because God desperately wants the people he made to live. Does that make sense? If you are a Christian, I encourage you, man, read the Bible like you've never read it before. And you know, I don't even necessarily mean read more of it than you have before. I mean read it like you've never read it before. Read it as the words of God that have been protected by God and given to you through thousands of years so that God can help you live and not die. And if you're not a Christian, I encourage you to fix that today. Because the God that was driven to reveal himself to man, I know is revealing himself to you this morning. And there is no better time to say yes than right now. Amen? Amen. Here's Pastor Jimmy to close. Thank you, Pastor Anthony. Yeah, if, if this is the Word of God, right, we, uh, we don't get to pick and choose <laughs> what parts we like and what parts we don't like, what parts we want to live by and what parts we don't want to live by. Um, we have an opportunity to actually handle and submit our lives to the God who reveals himself to us in scripture. And so I just want to give an opportunity here uh, to, to, give, to give a recognition, to give honor, to give submission of our lives to Jesus who, who's revealed uh, the perfect revelation of the Father uh, and, we, and we read about in, in Scripture. And so if you've never given your life to Jesus, if, you, if, you're, if you've been on the fence, if you've said, I don't, I don't know, maybe it's because I don't know that God's Word is true, or that this, this book here actually represents this, this Creator, God. Um, 
If you if you feel like you're in a place today where you're like, I, I think I'm compelled, some, the Holy Spirit's doing something in me, I just want to give an opportunity for you to respond um, respond to that by giving your life to the God who reveals himself to us in Scripture, the God who is revealed in Jesus, who went to the cross for us, who died the death that we, in fact, deserved to die in our place. So that through him, through what he's done, we can be in relationship to the God who's created all things.